Okay, well, th thank you, Kim, and thank you, everybody, for coming out this morning. Um, so, you know, I was asked to talk about my research, and of course, everybody wants you to talk about cannabis because it's very timely right now, the Senate vote last night. Um, and so I decided I would talk about green machine or tropical breeze, what's in a name when talking about cannabis? Um, and just so you know, those are not actually real names. <laughs> they sound like they could be though, right? Like, you know, there's, you know, green monster is a real name, so why not green machine? Um, but I didn't want to get into any kind of copyright or Disney suing me because of Luke Skywalker type situations. So um, just because, you know, a lot of people don't know what we do here uh, at BCIT in terms of research, which is one of the reasons why we're having this, um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit. The Natural Health and Food Products Research Group was founded in 1999. Um, and it really came out of uh, forensics and chemistry. Um, and it was, it was established really to address, at the time, what were industry and government research needs with respect to product quality, safety, and efficacy. Although I have to tell you, really like, kind of got stopped at quality. That was sort of the first step, and, and that's still an ongoing challenge and an evolving concept uh, in this area. And our metrics of project success are a little bit different than a lot of places. Um, it's about sector impact for us. We want to be able to have our research impact policy decisions, um, consumer health, obviously industry improvements, because that's what we do at BCIT, having the products we work on have presence in the marketplace, but also student involvement. Um, I like making students aware of what is out there, because when I did my undergraduate chemistry degree, and I'll tell you from the first talk, um, my year was the first year that the female students outnumbered the male students uh, in, in honors. Um, but I also had a professor tell me that I couldn't come to office hours because I was a girl and I was just going to have babies and never contribute anything to science. <laughs> so <laughs> we're not quite there yet. <laughs> the girls are ahead of the game is basically it. We were already on, in the honor students and we dominated at the same time. The professors weren't quite there yet. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I think mentorship is definitely plays a role because I've had some great mentors um, as a scientist, but pretty much all of them were male, and none of them had to deal with the challenges of childcare <laughs> and things like that in the same way that I did as a mother. But anyway, I digress. Um, so, and, and one of the great things about BCIT is we have these amazing programs and amazing students. And so right here, I've got four of my students from two different programs um, who, who are fabulous. And thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> Although you should be in the lab. Um, <laughs> that's, you know, so, so having, creating multidisciplinary teams in order to, to work with our industry projects is fabulous. Of course, as a Canada Research Chair, we have to publish. Um, but really, it's also about creating, keeping those connections with our industry partners so that our students and get employed, also important. So how we work with industry is we help them to develop products, differentiate, and create value. And we do this in a lot of different ways. Uh, crop diversification, we contribute to improved agricultural practices, evidence-based product development, improved products and processes, and of course, regulatory compliance for quality, safety, and efficacy. Um, because at the end of the day, one of the things that's unique about BCIT is our connection to industry and our understanding of the regulatory framework in which the industry sectors we work with are in. And that's something that is often lost in academic research. Um, you can have people doing some fabulous research and making really unique products that have no pathway to market. And so I really think it's important as scientists when we're engaging in research to understand that there has to actually be a pathway there or the ability to create one. Okay, you all came here not to hear about this, but to hear about cannabis. So at BCIT, we've actually had a controlled substance license on and off for, for a number of years, dating back uh, almost 15 years. Um, and, and more recently, over the past few years, uh, we have a, a, a controlled substance dealer's license. We're actually drug dealers, which is like, kind of cool. Kim's the big boss, just so you know. <laughs> so when you Google cannabis, um, you, you get 125 25 million hits in one second. Um, and, and interestingly, the top hits right now are all about Canada. Uh, I think this is like kind of fun. This is like a cookie. <laughs> this scares the heck out of me, I got to tell you. <laughs> is this the, oh no, I can't work that. Okay. <laughs> but we have, you know, you have, a, people are starting to talk about what's going to happen when we get into edibles. Are we gonna, even going to be able to analyze these? What's going to happen with dosing? What's going to happen with people getting access to them, you know, that shouldn't have access to cannabis? And basically what we have right now is, is a misinformation overload. <laughs> Not just information overload, but inf misinformation overload. And uh, just to touch on it, this is true about the regulations. How and who is allowed to use production, purchase, and research. Um, I have to tell you, when you talk about production, we went from MMAR, which was the access program, which allowed individuals to produce for themselves or assign someone to produce 
for themselves, right? Then we moved to MMPR because the government and most municipalities didn't really like the idea of people growing pot in their basement. So they decided they would have a process for licensed production, and this would enable them to have production controls and make sure that the products that were produced were free of microbials and pesticides and other contaminants. But then the Ellard uh, court case came through, and they kind of had to merge the two. So now you have an option. You can buy from a licensed producer, of which there's now 105 in Canada, um, or you can grow your own or designate someone to grow for you, but it's for personal use. Okay, now in talking about purchase, dispensaries are illegal. They are still illegal. They are all illegal. I don't want to hear anything else. <laughs> I know people think or they'd like to think that they're not, but they are illegal. Right? And when you have people who are amassing licenses under MMAR for multiple people who had a license to produce, that was also illegal. Because under the regulations, you could only hold a maximum of two. And once you produce that, it had to go back to that patient only. And really what happened in BC, because we're so enterprising here, <laughs> is people amassed tons of licenses so they could grow lots of cannabis. And then anyone who had a license could then access it. But this was a, a huge bending of the rules and kind of has led to a lot of confusion. Um, what we have right now is the ACMPR and licenses. Um, so people, it is still only medical cannabis. Uh, yes, the uh, Bill C-45 uh, was passed by the Senate, but it now goes back to the House of Commons because there was a lot of amendments that were also recommended. So there's still a long timeline out before we get to really what it's gonna look like for recreational. And also in terms of misinformation, I wanna talk a teeny bit about health outcomes because people talk a lot about medical cannabis. Right now it's designated as actually having no medical use <laughs> um, or no medical benefit. Um, and yet there's a plethora of information about there about what you can have. Oh yeah, that's the, everyone's looking G7 nation, yay, Canada's a leader. <laughs> that's great. Um, okay, so back to Green Machine or Tropical Breeze. Um, quite a while ago, uh, John Page initiated a, a genome project when he was at the Plant Biotechnology Institute and then at UBC, um, and he drafted up the genome and transcriptome of cannabis sativa, or at least we think it was cannabis sativa. And basically what he concluded was that the genetics of cannabis are muddled <laughs> at this point, and there's a lot of confusion and chaos. Okay. And this is still true. Um, and, and even if you look at it, his original research was done on purple kush, we think, and phenola, which was a hemp varietal, right? Um, but really when it comes down to it, people talk a lot about sativa versus indica, and in some case, uh, radialis, which is the other archaic one. Um, but we don't actually really know because we don't have any native land race. I mean, you're talking about a plant that's been um, manipulated in informal breeding programs uh, for, you know, hundreds of years. Right, so unless you're willing to, I don't know, maybe climb a mountain in Kazakhstan or something <laughs> and try to find something growing natively, it'd be very difficult to establish what is the true genome of a very specific species or varietal. Um, and so really, I think that when it comes down to talking about indica sativa, it, it's so mixed up now, it really doesn't matter. It, it doesn't really have any bearing about what it is that you have as a, as a product. Um, other work was done as well in the United States, um, Dr. Jeffrey Raber. He basically showed that indica and sativa is really just about morphology. Um, and, you know, it's a complete misconception that indica will put you to sleep and sativa is more energetic. Now, this stuff was published quite a while ago. Um, you know, we're talking five, ten years ago, right? So this isn't new. This is something that scientists have known for a long time. And yet, you can go <laughs> to, to Mary Jane's Almanac, <laughs> just published last year, um, that says it's common knowledge that sativa strains are uplifting, <laughs> right? And indica strains are relaxing. Okay, so this has already been established as not true, right? In, in clinical trials, in research studies, the chemistry, but, but this kind of information is still out there, and you can find all kinds of things. This is a cute little chart that tells you how you can guide which cannabis you should be selecting for whatever reason that you want to take it. Now, you couple that with the fact that you don't even really know what's in your cannabis, whether it is indica or sativa anyway. In fact, the scientists can't even really help you in that sense. So when we talk about what's in a name in cannabis, I think we kind of need to focus a little bit about what's in your cannabis. Um, and this was recently, this was a Globe and Mail and this is testing cannabis products and finding gross microbial contamination. Now, these products are mostly from dispensaries, not from licensed producers who have to comply with good uh, production practices that have been laid out, which includes microbial testing. And it goes more than that. I mean, 172 
this is uh, adverse event uh, recall. This is product recalls in health from Health Canada, and so you can see there's you know there's actually 172. I just pulled the most recent ones, um, but this is a everything from mislabeling to finding illegal you know un undeclared pesticides that aren't allowed to be used. Um, and I have to say that the pesticide choices are very strange because I, I don't think they're actually for pest management. It looks to me like these chemicals, which are mostly banned because they interrupt reproductive technologies, are more likely being used to feminize their plants. <laughs> and they're just sort of maybe a, a little bit um, ignorant about what these chemicals can actually do and how they transmit uh, when you're talking about a product. And even worse than that, in some cases, some of the pesticides, for example, that were being used in California, they discovered that when you burn them, it produces cyanide and, and can well, make you sick. So really, you know, I think the focus needs to be about basic quality standards. Um, I don't think identity is an issue. <laughs> it's actually not hard to tell that what you have is cannabis, <laughs> right? I mean, the smell alone, the look, I mean, it's really not that difficult. So we don't really have like with other plants an identity issue where you have adulteration by the wrong plant. Um, but we definitely have some purity issues. Um, we need to be able to establish strength. But what about potency, right? What, what about efficacy? This is supposed to be a medicinal product, right? And then what about these new delivery systems? cookies, <laughs> right, butter, shatter, <laughs> all kinds of fun stuff, and, and about the stability of the products, right, or, or the dosing, the homogeneity of them. You know, I was talking to uh, one of my friends, she's a, a doctor down in Santa Fe, um, and, and she's a, a herbalist as well as a medical doctor, um, and, and, and Dr. Lodog said, she goes, it's so hard, you know, you have this, uh, she works with a lot of integrated oncologists as well, and you have a patient, and they're in pain, and they want to take something, and they go to the dispensary, and they come back with their brownie or something, and I have no ability to tell them how much to eat <laughs> or what it's going to do, you know, so they eat like half, and nothing happens. And then they try the next day and eat the other half and they're like out cold on the floor for 24 hours because everything was in the other half of the brownie, right? So the, these are the kind of things that are going to happen as we get, move into recreational that kind of terrifies me. But what we do at BCIT, well, when we talk about um, what's in cannabis, this is what we look at. We look at the chemistry. Um, so this is an HPLC chromatogram and, and this is our... LCMS. I love this picture. I got to thank Elizabeth. I don't think she's here. Uh, Elizabeth Mudge is a is a, a research associate as as well as now a PhD student with me, um, and she took this really cool picture <laughs> from our lab. Um, and so we developed a method, and and lots of people have developed. There's lots of methods for measuring cannabinoids out there, um, but what's really different about ours is that we actually validated it according to internationally recognized standards. <laughs> um, because while lots of people are publishing analytical methods, I see even you know, I think next week or in a couple of weeks, there's a, a, a conference at UBC and, and they have great researchers like Ethan Russo talking about pharmacology and John Page is going to talk about genetics and research and tissue culture. And then for the chemistry part, it's just like a whole lineup of equipment suppliers <laughs> who are, are pushing their equipment and, and showing their methods, right? But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what equipment you use. It's, it's really about having a method that you've demonstrated, you un know the performance of, so you can have confidence in the data. Um, and so our method looks at 30 two cannabinoids, 14 are quantified at this point because that's how many chemical reference materials are available. Um, it's been adopted by the USP for their new cannabis monograph. Um, and, and more recently is the official method of analysis for AOAC first action. So that's kind of cool. Congratulations, Beth. But there's a lot more to cannabis than just quantifying the bare minimum of CBD, THC, and the other cannabinoids. And this is where it gets a little bit painful. Sorry, guys, it's a little early for this. But what we do in our lab when we want to look at a complex mixture is we do chemometric analysis of metabolomic data sets to explore plant secondary metabolite production and improve the quality of botanical-based products. That's basically what our basic research program is about. Um, but you know, that probably doesn't mean much to a lot of people, and you need, unfortunately, a few definitions here. So when we're talking about metabolomics, we follow what Oliver finds um, sort of the definitive <laughs> definition of metabolomics, which is the, the quantitative measure of low molecular mass metabolites at a specific time and a specific condition, right? And chemometrics is basically applying math to that data set <laughs> in, in a nutshell. Right, so when we do chemometric analysis of metabolomics data, the reason we do this is because this is a way for us to identify breaks in biosynthetic pathways, to visualize the phytochemical diversity, to discover novel biosynthetic pathways and correlations between different components of the plant. 
Um, phytochemical discovery. We've already discovered some new unknown compounds previously undescribed in cannabis. Um, and also to develop ultimately an alternative classification system because really we don't feel like the current classification system, which is basically CBD and THC, is a good reflection of the phytochemical diversity and the potential health benefits of this plant. And the other cool thing about doing chemometrics and metabolomics is that you can do hypothesis-driven research, which is what most researchers do. So that would be like THC, CBD, and strain delineations are insufficient to classify cannabis. So that's our basic hypothesis. Or it can be hypothesis generating where our data discovered that this informal breeding has actually led to a loss of phytochemical diversity and is a perfect example of domestication syndrome in a plant. Okay, back to Mary Jane's almanac. So we, and I just can't help myself. Uh, so we, we massed a whole lot of products um, in cannabis. And, and, uh, and if you remember, I'm just going to say, sativa's supposed to be uplifting, and everybody knows this, and indica is relaxing. Okay, so here's AB Can. And this is, I don't know, we had a bunch from them. And I just want to show you the, the top one is Sputnik. It's indica. And it came with a sunshine and a moon. Not sure what that means. I guess you can use it day or night. Relaxing, uplifting, I don't know. Uh, nebula sativa <laughs> is a sativa. It also has a sun and a moon, <laughs> right? And then we have Sensei Star Indica. That's the yellow one in the bottom here. Um, and it has a sun. So it's a daytime one. Um, but, I, but everybody knows that Indica is supposed to be a sleepy time one. So I'm a little confused. So again, it's, it's very difficult, I think, as a consumer, even under our regulatory environment, to make good decisions about what products they need and how they're going to work for them. Um, here's another example. These are some products from Canamed. Um, they're 410. And you actually have to go to the website to get more detailed information because the bottles are only what's required, which is just THC, CBD levels. That's pretty much it. And then the labeling requirements, which is a whole bunch of cautionary tales <laughs> on, the, on the labels. So 410 is suitable for many conditions, and the CBD may offset the anxiety caused by THC. OK. 15.5 is suitable for many conditions. <laughs> um, and you might benefit uh, by having the synergy between THC and CBD. I don't really know how you what that means um, in terms of, of the selection that you're making. And 17.1, which is a high THC, is suitable for patients looking for pain. But again, the reality is that when you're talking about health conditions, in particular pain, especially if you're talking about chronic pain, there's a very fine line between pain and addictions. And we know this very well due to the opioid crisis. And if you're taking something that is that high in THC alone, um, the anxiety part, <laughs> you know, there's other components out there, and it's not just the CBD versus THC, it's, it's terpenes alone, have already been shown to have, an, an, have negative indications um, for some of these health outcomes. So it's not just a matter of making sure you have that right ratio of CBD and THC, it's also making sure that there are particular terpenes that aren't present and other ones that are there that are complementary. But you don't see all that. What you get is like this, and it's like such a mixed bag. Um, like I said, you can go and find more information outside of CBD and THC. So for example, um, if you're buying from Tweed, they have these, cute, these nice little pie charts that show you what the dominant terpenes are in the product. Um, but overall, you get a mix. And, and actually, one of the products we ordered actually came with a cookbook. <laughs> Sorry. It's like Annie's cookbook. It's like, yeah, I haven't actually tried any of the recipes, but I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so phytochemical characterizations. OK, so um, what we did is we looked at the, if you look at the marijuana plant material available from the National Institute of Drug Abuse at the NIH uh, in the US, so this would be the materials that are produced in the University of Mississippi by Dr. Mahmoud El Sali and are available to research in the United States um, through their drug supply program, they basically have like five basic categories plus placebo. And uh, I just showed them when we looked at gathered a bunch of materials in Canada, this is what we got. Um, so pink, green, orange, purple, blue represent the different NIDA categories. Okay, now. They don't look quite identical. You can see there's you know, a scale there with the blue um, and with all of them. Um, but the NIDA categories are based solely on CBD and THC. Um, and this graph is lowest THC to highest THC, um, but also includes all of the cannabinoids. And I, I circled a couple here because this cuts back to what's in the name. OK, so Tweed has a strain called Argyle. It's trademarked. And Afria has a strain called Churchill. Right, or a product called Churchill, which is also trademarked. Um, and so I circled them, and you can see they kind of look identical, right? They're right in the middle of that orange, and they're pretty close to each other. And actually, their CBD and THC contents are, are very, very consistent. 
But if you look at all of the cannabinoids together, I'll come back to that. When you look at all the cannabinoids together and you do uh, our chemometrics and develop a model, you can actually see here that, does this thing come up? No, it doesn't. Oh, bummer. This doesn't, okay. <laughs> you can see that they don't separate clearly, right? So if these are, are good categories and good ways of differentiating these different products, they should be completely separated. Um, in this model, and they're not. And when we look a little closer using the loadings plot, we see that when you have products um, that have been bred for t high THC, you see a loss of phytochemical diversity, you see a shutdown of the CBDA synthetic pathway, and a loss of a lot of different chemicals. In fact, the ones that contain CBD, um, the differentiation um, and the variants within those products are really contributed to a lot of unknown and minor compounds, whereas the THC dominant ones that don't have that CBD pathway active are really just being contributed by a few known compounds, and so it's much less interesting. And so you basically have a, a generification of, of cannabis based on the drive to increase THC. And this is a heat map, it's sort of showing them basically the same thing. And of course, terpenes. So we did terpene analysis too, 67 terpenes, 29 monoterpenes, 38 sesquiterpenes. We classified them based on whether they were, I got you. No one needs to ask me questions, it's good. <laughs> you know, whether, whether, whether um, they were present in all or unique to some. But ultimately the goal was to be able to fuse that data together. Like surely we can come up with a better classification that represents both terpenes and the cannabinoids. And so this is what we did. <laughs> so this is a high level data fusion. I'm not gonna go into all the math and fun stuff behind it. Um, but you can see the different color categories become more and more scattered. Um, and, and when you really look at, at the sesquiterpenes versus the monoterpenes versus the cannabinoids, um, you kind of see like what looks like a really big mess. But luckily we can use other models. <laughs> so this is a higher clustering analysis. Um, and basically what it comes down to is that THC, CBD, content uh, classification is insufficient um, and that we really do need to account for the low level cannabinoids and the impact that terpenes have and ultimately what it comes down to is for example those two products which are are the same strain phytochemically end up in different categories when you take into account the total chemistry so what's in a name when talking cannabis not much <laughs> most of the products in the marketplace are trademarked um, the strains out there are made up there, you can't even rightly call them chemovars or chemotypes at this point. Um, really, you have to rely on, on validated quality metrics, the cannabinoids, the terpene data, making sure that you don't have pesticides, microbials, aflatoxins. Heavy metals are not actually as much of a big deal, but you do have to do that testing. Um, really, at this point, our focus is on exploring the correlations between the total chemistry and the metabolome. So even going beyond cannabinoids and terpenes and using our fancy million dollar NMR <laughs> to look at the total chemistry um, and, and making a correlation between those and what we consider to be product choices, which really is, is dictated by health outcomes and why people are choosing these products. And so we're working with a number of different producers who gather that information. Um, so that's it for me in cannabis. I wanna acknowledge the people that I work with, they're awesome. Hazra, Michael, Ronan, Jamie, all graduates of BCIT, by the way. <laughs> um, the Chao Wei, Dr. Zhang, who's here. Um, Hong, Roberta from the food department, uh, Ng, and Elizabeth Mudge, my PhD student. Again, my undergrads for, for coming this morning. <laughs> you need to get back to work. And I have to acknowledge the Canada Research Chair Program, so they continue to fund me and NSERC. And that's it. See, uh, this is just a minute. Thank you.